So that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. And we start with question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are many things that divide the First Minister and I, but on this International Women's Day, uh, I'm sure we can both agree that we'll do everything that we can to ensure the next generation of women have fewer battles to fight. And speaking of battles, can I ask the First Minister why, after a decade of SNP government, are one quarter of GP practices in Scotland missing at least one doctor? First Minister. Well, Firstly, on a note of consensus that may not last very long, can I uh, echo Ruth Davidson's comments about International Women's Day. Uh, today, of course, is an opportunity for us to recognise countless women, uh, not just those whose names we know, but also those whose names we don't know, but women who have battled and who continue to battle for change in their communities, their workplaces, uh, and all across Scotland. Today is an opportunity to salute them, but also rededicate ourselves to continued progress for the next generation of women in Scotland and indeed globally. Um, in terms of the question uh, relating to GPs, uh, of course, Ruth Davidson will be aware that we are taking a range of actions around uh, GP recruitment. That includes action to get more uh, people into GP uh, me into medical schools, into GP training, to encourage uh, people into rural practices, for example. And of course, overall, uh, the statistics that were published earlier this week show that our primary care workforce is at its highest ever level, uh, thanks to increases in nurses and healthcare support workers. And of course, the new GP contract uh, will help us to ensure uh, that the action we are already taking is intensified in the period ahead. Ruth Davison. Presiding officer, according to the First Minister's own statistics, just four years ago, only one in 10 GP surgeries was missing a doctor. Now it's just one in four. That's not progress. And I'll spell it out. It's because under the SNP, GP services are in crisis, and we've known it for months. Last year, we wrote to every single GP practice in Scotland, asking to hear their concerns. And here's just some of the responses that we got back. A GP in the Highlands declaring, I think the Scottish Government has forgotten that Scotland extends north of Perth. Another doctor adding, the new Scottish GP contract is a disaster for rural GPs. A practice in Aberdeen, where both GPs are set to retire in the next few years, saying that they can't find anyone to replace them. All of this is against a backdrop of demand rising, GP numbers falling and surgeries closing. The First Minister has had 10 years to sort this out. Why hasn't she? First Minister. Well, there's a number of points here. Uh, firstly, Ruth Davidson wants to suggest this is all about the SNP, and I suppose the implication is if only the Tories were in government, it would be all much better, which I suppose begs the question why, uh, where the Tories are in power in the UK, we see the decline in GPs double what it is in Scotland. But back to the issue, back to the issue in Scotland, and I hope uh, Ruth Davidson uh, wasn't intending to scaremonger about the new GP contract because if we look at the issues of, of rural general practice in particular, under the terms of the new contract, no GP practice in Scotland will lose funding. Uh, and that's not just something this government is saying, that is something the BMA itself uh, has been at pains to stress. In fact, uh, all of the measures in the new GP contract are about making sure we can encourage uh, more professionals into uh, general practice. It's also about making sure we are reducing the unnecessary workload on GPs uh, and the provisions on multidisciplinary working are particularly important in that regard. And it's also about making sure that those uh, GPs who have the biggest workload uh, get additional funding to recognise that. Of course, the recent budget uh, that was passed in this parliament uh, included new resources to support primary care uh, and general practice within that. And perhaps Ruth Davidson, uh, if she is so concerned about this issue, would like to explain to the general public across Scotland why she and her colleagues voted against that additional funding for primary care. Ruth Davidson. Again, we've got the same old story from the First Minister. Judge me by my promises for tomorrow, not by my actual record that exists today. And the truth is that the SNP's mismanagement of our NHS is making the situation far, far worse. And for example, just over a year ago, I asked the First Minister at First Minister's questions about the spiralling cost of locums. Medical staff brought in at huge expense because there aren't enough NHS staff to fill shifts. 
And last year, the First Minister was clear. Health boards should minimise their use of agency staff. Well, we've looked again at the cost of locum staff using freedom of information. And it has now risen again, breaking the £300 million barrier for the very first time. So, we've got GPs telling us that they're having to close their doors because of poor workforce planning. And because of a lack of staff across the NHS, taxpayers are shelling out a third of a billion pounds on costly locums and private agency workers, despite assurances that numbers would go down and not up. Does that sound like good planning to her? First Minister. Well, let me just uh, look at the issue of agency uh, spending in particular. The combined medical and nursing agency costs represent uh, just around 2% of the overall staffing budget. And Ruth Davidson uh, might be interested to know that that is a third less uh, proportionately than it is uh, south of the border, where, of course, the Conservatives are actually in government. I know, I know, that, I know Ruth Davidson doesn't like this, and let me be clear. We don't judge ourselves by standards elsewhere. We set our own standards. But when Ruth Davidson or any other uh, member of the opposition stands in this parliament and says, you know, it would all be better if only my party was in government, then it is legitimate to look at where their party is in government. And you know what? I'm afraid, unfortunately, for Ruth Davidson, that doesn't paint a very pretty picture. But of course, this is the week we had statistics published in Scotland that show that under this SNP government, the NHS workforce has increased by more than 10%. That's more than 13,000 additional people working in our NHS today than was the case when we took office. So we will continue to invest record sums in our NHS and support record numbers of staff working in our NHS and it's because of that of course that we also know that something else in Scotland is at a record high and that is patient satisfaction. Ruth Davidson. Oh. If the First Minister is so desperate to talk about the rest of the UK perhaps you should explain to the Chamber why as a proportion of NHS funding general practice gets a smaller share in Scotland than any other of the home nations of the United <laughs> Kingdom. But, presiding officer, here is the government's record. 160 fewer GPs. Vacancies trebling in the last five years. A third of GPs in post now nearing retirement. And an entire NHS propped up by expensive private agencies to fill the gaps left by poor workforce planning. And this is a crisis of the First Minister's own making. Because the fact of the matter is that the share of funding to GPs has fallen since this SNP government came into office. In fact, it has fallen in eight out of the last ten years. Is it any wonder GP surgeries are in such a mess? First Minister. Well, let me also talk about the record of this government. Record funding in our National Health Service. Record numbers of people working in our National Health Service. 10% increase since this government took office, extra money being committed to primary care and general practice, a target uh, to reach 11% going to primary care uh, as a percentage of the overall NHS budget, money going into the NHS uh, generally and within that going into primary care, money that the Tories voted against in the budget. And it is simply not credible. It is not credible for the Tories to come to this chamber and say somehow that they think there should be more investment in the NHS when they voted against the investment we're already making. So why doesn't Ruth Davidson look the Scottish people in the eye and try to explain that? Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. And can I offer greetings and solidarity from these benches on this worldwide International Women's Day? Uh, Presiding Officer, Scottish Labour supports increasing child benefit, both as a way of helping with the rising cost of living and tackling the national shame of child poverty. It's the difference that this Parliament could start making with our new powers over Social Security. But last week, the SNP and the Tories voted together against a Labour amendment to deliver it. Scottish Labour and the Scottish Greens support this policy, as do the Poverty Alliance and the Child Poverty Action Group. So why won't the Scottish Government? First Minister. Well, actually, 
This is a really important issue and firstly I think Richard Leonard and I uh, share the aspiration and the commitment to end child poverty in Scotland. In terms of the top up child benefit campaign that's something I've uh, looked at very carefully as has Angela Constance. I respect uh, many of the organisations uh, who are making the case uh, for that. One of the issues with it though is that if we go down uh, that road, I think seven out of every £10 uh, that we would spend on that policy would go to families who don't actually live in poverty. Now I, as Richard Leonard knows, I'm an advocate of universal benefits, but when you're looking at topping up an already universal benefit to specifically target families in poverty, then I think the question is raised about whether that would be the best way to do it. And of course, as Richard Leonard knows, we uh, asked the new Poverty and Inequality Commission for advice uh, to inform the uh, delivery plan that we will publish by the end uh, of this month. That advice was published uh, last week. And that advice in itself uh, raises the question about whether this is in fact the best way uh, to tackle child poverty. So we will publish our delivery plan, as I say, by the end of March, and we will make very clear in that plan the steps that we intend to take including using new powers but what we are determined to do is make sure that the money we spend to tackle child poverty uh, is actually used to do that so I hope that we can continue to have a constructive discussion in this chamber on that uh, as we take forward what I hope is our joint commission, uh, commitment to end uh, child poverty in Scotland. Richard Leonard. Well in the spirit of constructive debate I would like to point out that child benefit is usually paid directly to the mother. It gives a degree of financial independence and is more likely to be, to be spent on the children. And that is something that uh, Labour wants to see with all benefits, uh, particularly universal credit. So we think that universal credit should be automatically split between the two partners in a relationship. These split payments are supported by organisations like Engender and Scottish Women's Aid. And an SNP MP just this week has published a private member's bill to address this very issue. In the Westminster Parliament, offering not just a choice, but for split payments to be automatic. Yet just last week, SNP MSPs here voted against split payments in the Social Security Bill. First Minister, I want to see progressive change across the whole of the UK but why is this government currently blocking the delivery of benefit payments directly to women in Scotland? First Minister. As Richard Leonard knows, we, we have already made modifications where we can to how universal credit is paid. Uh, we are committed to working with women's organisations, with stakeholders more generally, uh, to look at additional changes that we can perhaps uh, make. And I know that that one, splitting uh, the payments, is certainly one that I, I do think is worthy of further consideration. We require to discuss this also uh, with the the UK government, because one of the things that has perhaps escaped Richard Leonard's notice is that we don't have full control over universal credit. So we cannot always unilaterally make the changes that we want to make. But I think anybody looking at the range of actions we are taking to try to use flexibilities around universal credit, uh, arguing actually uh, against the rollout of universal credit when it's penalising so many people. Uh, the child poverty bill that was passed by this parliament, the commitment to the delivery plan, the commitment to using our new powers around the, the new Best Start grant, for example, that there is a real commitment on the part of this government to tackle child poverty effectively. And I really hope that uh, no matter all the other things that divide us, uh, this is one issue where we could actually get the support of Scottish Labour. And if they want us to go further, if they want us to go further and reform the welfare system more generally, then they also really need uh, to advocate powers over welfare, getting out of the hands of Westminster and coming to this parliament. Richard Leonard. Let me be clear, the rollout of universal credit has been a shambles. But these new powers in this parliament over social security give us a chance to build a fundamentally fairer society. And I accept... And I, I accept that the Scottish Government has already taken action around the flexibility of universal credit, paying the housing element directly to landlords, paying fortnightly rather than monthly. But these very moves establish the principle and the practice that payments can be delivered in a different way in Scotland. And let's not forget why automatic split payments need to happen. 
There are too many women experiencing domestic abuse where the abuser holds the purse strings. Automatically splitting these payments is a practical step that this Parliament could take. So will the First Minister ensure that this is and becomes a hallmark of Scotland's first social security bill. First Minister. I genuinely, in the interest of consensus, on, on an issue that's very close to my heart and I know is close to the heart of Richard Leonard and his colleagues, the very fact that we have exercised flexibilities where we can, and Richard Leonard uh, recognised that, I think should tell everybody that we're not in some way ideologically opposed to doing so. But there are complexities associated with this, particularly on universal credit, where we have limited power, but the main powers still lie with Westminster. So the issue of split payments, and I absolutely recognise uh, the rationale for that that Richard Leonard has outlined, is something we are exploring and talking to others about and will continue to do so. And if it is possible to do that in a coherent uh, way, then there would be a commitment for us to take that forward. So, you know, I, I would say to Richard Leonard, and I say this in all sincerity, these these are important issues and I don't think anybody uh, on the government benches could ever be accused of not treating these issues seriously. So let's try to see if we can work together to do this. But there's a bigger issue here. This is International uh, Women's Day as, as has been recognised. And the fact that the, the majority of welfare power still lie in the hands of a Tory government at Westminster mean that on this International Women's Day, we have in law the rape clause, for example, an absolute obscenity. So yes, let's look at using flexibilities where we can but why don't we also come together to say once and for all, let's not let Tories at Westminster run the welfare system. Let's do it here in Scotland for ourselves. Wouldn't that be a good way to celebrate International Women's Day? I've got two constituency requests. The first from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been inundated with messages from constituents in Gerloch and Wester Ross. They're incensed and anxious about a decision by SEPA to approve a new licence for sewage treatment. It's for a new ultraviolet violet system, uh, which is only going to be operational during peak tourist and bathing seasons. And this leaves the rest of the year with an inferior downgraded system, allowing bacteria and sewage into the sea. Can I ask the First Minister if she thinks this is acceptable for some of our most beautiful coastline, or will her government step in and intervene to protect water quality in the area. First Minister. Well, can I uh, firstly express um, a great degree of sympathy with uh, the question that has been asked and the sentiment behind that question. Uh, however, as Rhoda Grant, I, I am sure, will be aware there is a, a formal process that is going through in these cases. As I understand it, ministers have now received a, a formal request to review Scottish Water's application to SEPA. Uh, given that, it would be inappropriate for me to comment uh, any further in detail at this stage. Uh, but just to give some factual information, the request was received on the 5th of March. Uh, ministers have 14 days from then to determine whether the application should be uh, given further uh, consideration and then a further 14 days to decide if the application uh, should be formally called in. So while I absolutely understand why this question is being raised, I hope members will appreciate that it would be in nobody's interest given that formal process if I was to say any more in substance about it at this time. And Jenny Mara. It came to light yesterday that the Director of Finance at NHS Tayside has retired after £5.3 million was carried forward into the NHS Tayside budget when these were national funds. Two weeks ago, NHS Tayside asked the Scottish Government for brokerage for the fifth year in a row, but this morning they are back for more. We know that the Scottish Government has ordered a swift forensic audit, but how much worse must this financial basket case get before the First Minister herself meets with the board NHS Tayside to ensure that this mess does not affect patients and staff in Dundee? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, as Jenny Mara, I know, uh, is aware of the uh, very fact that the Scottish Government provides brokerage to ensure that the financial position in NHS Tayside remains stable is because our overriding priority is the protection of patient care uh, and services and to ensure that they remain the priority. In terms of the specific issue that Jenny Mara uh, has raised, and she's right uh, to raise it, 
This is uh, an issue about the way in which NHS uh, Tayside have uh, recorded uh, certain amounts of money within their accounts that potentially gives an inaccurate picture of their overall financial position. As soon as this situation came to light, uh, the Scottish Government commissioned an independent external review. That uh, review is now underway. It's been carried out by Grant Thornton and it will report back within two weeks. Uh, and of course, when uh, we know uh, the outcome of that, any further action that is required to be taken will be taken. But in the meantime, yes, we will provide additional brokerage to ensure that Tayside's financial position remains stable because that is in the overriding interest of patients. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I echo the words that others have already uh, given around our commitment to International Women's Day and hope that all political parties will use this afternoon's debate to recommit ourselves to progress on gender equality and justice. Uh, can I read to the First Minister some words from a constituent of mine called Kirsty? She says, I went to Scottish Youth Theatre Summer School when I was 14, and it completely changed my life. I, I made friends with some of the most wonderful people I've ever met there. I completely fell in love with Glasgow, and I was inspired to eventually move here to study theatre. Uh, Kirsty says she's never forgot, forgotten that amazing opportunity, and that she just took it for granted that the Scottish Youth Theatre would always exist and that she'd be able to encourage her little niece to go to the summer school when she was old enough. Kirsty is by no means alone, and I suspect every member of this parliament uh, will have constituents whose lives have been enriched and even transformed in this way. This year is being billed as the year of young people. Are we really going to let Scottish Youth Theatre close? First Minister. Well, I'm actually glad uh, Patrick Harvey raised this issue because it gives me the opportunity to say uh, a couple of things about it. I mean, the, the first thing I must say, and uh, Patrick Harvey and others will understand why this is the case, is that the decisions about which organisations receive regular funding uh, is for Creative Scotland. And in law, uh, the Scottish Government has no role in that process and is not able to intervene in that process. Uh, that said, uh, the announcement by the Scottish Youth Theatre, for the reasons that Patrick Harvey has outlined, is of uh, serious concern. Uh, it will be of serious concern to many people across Scotland, and indeed it is to me. Um, I know that Creative Scotland has approved uh, some uh, funding to allow the organisation to continue to operate while they hopefully work together uh, to look at alternative routes to support, and I would encourage the Scottish Youth Theatre to continue uh, these discussions. I've also asked the Culture Secretary to offer to meet with the Scottish Youth Theatre to see whether uh, there is some action that the Scottish Government could be party to that would help to secure a future for uh, the Scottish Youth Theatre. Uh, yes, we are in the year of young people, but more generally than that, uh, arts and, and culture and theatre within that are really, really important to the well-being of our country. There will always be difficult uh, decisions on funding to be made and uh, I think sometimes Creative Scotland is unfairly criticised because they have to make uh, these decisions but we want to make sure that theatre and youth theatre in particular uh, can flourish uh, not just in this year but generally in Scotland. Patrick Harvey. Creative Scotland have indeed come in for serious criticism this year in relation to funding decisions but also to a confused and damaging process that they've gone through. But I accept that the Scottish Government can't simply pick up the phone and instruct them uh, on who they should fund and who they shouldn't. But the Scottish Government does also have a direct responsibility, I believe, for a national asset like the Scottish Youth Theatre. The people working at Scottish Youth Theatre who are still committed to delivering as much of their summer programme as they can and the young people they work with uh, deserve some good news in this. They deserve some confidence about the organisation's future. Presiding officer, Scottish Youth Theatre were here, performing here at the opening of the Scottish Parliament, the opening of this session of the Scottish Parliament in 2016, uh, a performance called Open the Doors. I think it would be appalling if we stand by and see their doors, doors closed this year as a result of these decisions. Can I ask the First Minister to ensure that the Scottish Government, whether in working with Creative Scotland or through another route, ensures that we do not see that happen and that Scottish Youth Theatre does not have to close its doors this year? First Minister. Well, I've... I've got a great deal of sympathy with what Patrick Harvey has just said. 
Um, Scottish Youth Theatre do fantastic work and I think uh, it would be the desire of all of us to see them uh, able to continue to do that. Uh, I've uh, already uh, given the, the position in terms of the uh, Scottish Government's inability to intervene in decisions that Creative Scotland make about regular funding. Uh, actually though, uh, the Scottish Youth Theatre, as I understand it, weren't previously in receipt of, of regular funding. In fact, uh, when the decisions were making, uh, taken in the last round of that, uh, my predecessor as, as First Minister, uh, I think, was involved in, in exploring options at that time. So we will continue to work with Creative Scotland and with the Scottish Youth Theatre. As I said, I've asked Fiona Hislop to offer to meet with them. And uh, while I can't give detail about what those options might be today, um, I certainly give a commitment that we will do everything we can to fully explore all options to allow uh, young people in the future to benefit from uh, the Scottish Youth Theatre in the way that young people in the past have done. And a few additional supplementaries. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, if I can follow on the theme of uh, Patrick Harvey. Scottish Youth Theatre has been in existence for over 40 years. It is world-renowned and its present state is actually in my constituency in the Merchant City in Glasgow. I hear what the First Minister is saying, but to say that this world-renowned company, these young people in the Year of Young People, is to close its doors in July this year, just because Creative Scotland cannot find money for them is basically a very big slap in the face and a kick in the teeth for the Scottish Youth Theatre. The First Minister mentioned that uh, she would speak to the Cabinet Secretary for Culture. Can I ask the First Minister if she would arrange a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary of Culture between myself and other interested parties to ensure that this absolutely essential youth theatre is allowed to continue? First Minister. Well, again, you know, I, I thank Sandra White for, for raising this issue. As I said, I've asked uh, Fiona Hislop to offer to meet with the Scottish Youth Theatre, and uh, hopefully that uh, is a meeting that will take place. I'm sure she would also uh, be happy to meet with Sandra White and other interested members as well. Um, there's, there's not much more that I am able to say today in addition to what I've already said. I, I think anybody uh, listening not only to what I'm saying, but probably reading between the lines of what I'm saying, uh, can hear that I've got a lot of sympathy with the sentiments that are being expressed. Clearly, there are always difficult decisions to be taken about funding. Of course, the, the budget for Creative Scotland and for Culture and the Arts increased uh, this year uh, in the budget that we've just passed. Uh, there are many organisations who previously didn't get regular funding who will be getting regular funding. Uh, and of course, we've managed to mitigate the impact of cuts to lottery funding. So uh, these difficult decisions cannot be completely escape but we are determined to look at all options uh, to protect if we can uh, the work that the Scottish Youth Theatre does and to support uh, as far as we can a healthy vibrant culture sector across Scotland generally. Lewis Macdonald. Thank you very much. The First Minister will know that Balfour Beatty hold many public sector contracts in Scotland not least on the AWPR. Does she share my concern at the company's plans announced this morning to close their electricity substation design office at Contour in Aberdeenshire uh, at the cost of the jobs there and to bid for all future work in Scotland's electricity network from out, out with Scotland. If she does share those concerns, will she raise them with Balfour Beatty and will she tell them to drop their closure plans and instead of making workers redundant, to sit down with staff in Contour and plan a sustainable future for their Scottish business uh, for the time ahead? First Minister. Decisions and announcements like this, of course, are always uh, of concern, and uh, this one is certainly no different. Uh, in direct response to Lewis MacDonald's question, yes, we will engage uh, with Balfour Beatty about this, and I'm sure the Economy Secretary would be happy to uh, meet with or, or write to uh, Lewis MacDonald after we've had the opportunity to do so. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of my uh, successful campaign to bring about laws in this place to protect people um, victims of non-consensual sharing of intimate images, commonly known as revenge porn. Can the First Minister tell us how her government will respond to reports this week that less, that less than half of revenge porn cases are actually passed to prosecutors? First Minister. Well, the impact of sharing intimate images, uh, as we all know, can be hugely damaging, and there is absolutely no place for that in our society. That's indeed why we brought forward legislation for a specific offence of sharing or threatening to share in intimate images without consent and that offence has a maximum penalty uh, on conviction uh, of five years imprisonment. Uh, a public awareness campaign consisting uh, of uh, advertising and PR work ran to coincide with the offence 
coming into effect. I, uh, of course, like Christina McKelvey, uh, would have been, was concerned at the statistics that we saw this week. The investigation of the offence, of course, is for Police Scotland and prosecution is for uh, the Crown Office. We know there are particular complexities for police in investigating offences committed using internet services, often hosted in foreign uh, jurisdictions. Addiction and the rate of prosecution for these offences in Scotland is broadly similar to that that we see in England and Wales. But the message I took uh, from these statistics this week, and I think Christina McKelvey is absolutely right to raise it, is while putting laws in place it is important, making sure that these laws can effectively be used is what matters most. And I think these statistics tell us uh, that there is still work to be done on this important issue. Question number four, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government is making on increasing the number of modern apprenticeships. First Minister. Uh, we're making very good progress on increasing modern apprenticeships in line with our commitment to deliver 30,000 new starts a year by 2020. Investing in skills development through apprenticeships makes a vital contribution to inclusive economic growth uh, and we have increased Skills Development Scotland's funding uh, by 7% next year. Uh, next year's target of 28,000 apprenticeship starts will for the first time include graduate apprenticeships which provide the opportunity to study for a degree while in full-time paid employment. Uh, this week of course we are celebrating Scottish Apprenticeship Week which is a fantastic opportunity for apprentices and their employers to promote the benefits of apprenticeships across all sectors and the life-changing opportunities that they provide. Gillian Martin. I thank the First Minister for that answer. There is a myth that apprenticeships are just for school leavers, but they can offer a pathway to more mature adults who, for whatever reason, find themselves further from the workforce. Can the First Minister give details on what's been done to make apprenticeships accessible to those people who might later in life be in need of training to improve their employability and also give some more detail on the Graduate Apprenticeship Scheme? Minister. Well, Gillian Martin is absolutely correct to say that while apprenticeships are an important option for school leavers, they increasingly also provide a diverse range of work-based learning opportunities for people of all ages and all backgrounds. Uh, indeed, last year we saw an increase of over 20% in the number of over 25 starting an apprenticeship, uh, and already during the course of this year we see that figure growing even further. So diversifying as well as expanding our apprenticeships is another vital way of opening up access by creating new pathways into work. Uh, the graduate apprenticeships offer the opportunity to develop high-level skills in emerging STEM-related areas uh, and foundation apprenticeships are expanding the vocational op uh, options available in the senior phase of uh, school. So I think there's a lot to be very positive about here, but Gillian uh, Martin is absolutely correct to point to the need not only to increase the numbers, but to make sure we have greater diversity in all its respects as well. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Uh, I thank the First Minister for answers on this issue um, and I agree with her on the life-changing opportunities that apprenticeships provide. I'm sure many of the colleagues across the chamber have seen that this week as they visited apprenticeships as, apprentices across Scotland. However, will the First Minister recognise this month's report from SF, uh, FSB Scotland on the particular barriers that small businesses in Scotland face in taking on apprentices? And will she consider how its recommendations could help ensure small businesses get a fairer access to support and clearer information about taking on apprentices in future? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, the FSB, uh, I think, uh, make important recommendations. We recognise that there often will be barriers for smaller companies that larger companies do not face and experience. So as we continue to increase the number of modern apprenticeships, indeed as we continue to diversify them as well, it's really important that we give all companies across Scotland who feel that their business would benefit the opportunity uh, to take up uh, an apprentice opportunity. So this is an important part of the overall process that we're engaged in. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to educate children regarding using the internet safely. First Minister. We all want children and young people to be aware of their rights online, enjoy the internet, show resilience and take advantage of the opportunities on offer. It is the prerogative of children and young people to explore and enjoy the online world, but we have a collective responsibility to ensure that they do so safely. Uh, children and young people learn about the safe and responsible use of different technologies uh, as part of their broad general education under Curriculum for Excellence, and we're also working with others to continue to deliver briefing sessions to support professionals, parents and carers to keep children safe, as well as working with young people themselves to identify and develop ways of supporting themselves and their peers. Murdo Fraser. Can I thank the First Minister for her response, and we agree with her that everyone 
involved uh, with young people, either professionally or simply as a parent, will have concerns about safe use of the internet by uh, children. Uh, this week, the Scottish Children and Young People's Commissioner called for three major changes to the relationship between children and the internet. Digital citizenship lessons, a public ombudsman to mediate between under 18s and social media companies, and simplified terms and conditions for young people. Now, I know that the Scottish Government published an action plan uh, last year in this area. I wonder whether it has considered whether that action plan needs to be updated to take account of these new calls. First Minister. Well, firstly, we will fully consider the recommendations that Murdo Fraser uh, has talked about in his question. I think, in, in short, the answer to the question, do we think the action plan requires to be updated, I, I think given the nature of what we're talking about here, the answer to that is yes. I think by the very nature of the internet and digital technology, <coughs> we have to make sure that the actions we are taking keep pace with those technological changes. So uh, we will continue to look at what more can be done. Uh, the internet is such a fantastic uh, resource and young people should feel confident about enjoying the benefits of it but we all know the risks that are there uh, and it's therefore important that we do look carefully at the actions that need to be taken to keep children safe and I can give an assurance to the chamber today that we will continue to do that on an ongoing basis. Question number six, Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to figures that show black and Asian people in Scotland are more likely to be stopped and searched. First Minister. Well, last month, the advisory group on Stop and Search, chaired by John Scott QC, produced a report evaluating the first six months of the Code of Practice on Stop and Search. And I understand that yesterday the group issued an amendment to some of the figures in its report uh, that Anna Sarwar has drawn on. Uh, the group's conclusions, though, remain unchanged. The report clearly shows that the rate of searches declined across all ethnic groups and the positive detection rate of searches increased across all ethnic groups, which suggests the police are focusing searches more effectively. Uh, in my view, it is vital that people in Scotland can have confidence in policing whatever their ethnicity, uh, and the Justice Secretary commissioned this evaluation so that we can understand how well Stop and Search is operating. A fuller evaluation will be carried out later this year, and it will look at all of these issues in more detail. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I raised the issue of the original statistics in good faith as they reflected the experiences that my constituents had raised with me. I recognise and accept that the author has since corrected an error and published an amendment to that report. The First Minister will know from her own constituents that there is at the very least a perception of bias in stopping and searching amongst our diverse minority ethnic communities. A number of individuals Representative organisations, including the Muslim Council of Scotland, the Pakistan Forum, the Scottish Afghan Human Rights Foundation and Positive Action in Housing, as well as serving and retired officers, have repeated this concern in the last few days. The current stop and start statistics do not include vehicle stops, airport or port stops or British transport police figures. As the First Minister has rightly said, building the trust and confidence of our communities is crucial. Will the First Minister therefore commit to review covering all these areas and to meet with representatives of our diverse minority communities? And finally, as members across this chamber have recognised, it is unfortunate that some senior figures have attempted to shut this de debate down by accusing me, and I quote, of playing the race card or having a personal agenda. That's the attitude that needs to be challenged yeah. because this agenda is personal to me. And it should be personal to anyone that believes in equality in all its forms. First Minister. Well, firstly, let me be very clear. I don't uh, question Anna Sarwar's good faith in uh, raising these statistics, and I don't question the good faith of anybody involved in this debate. It is a really important issue, and I know that from my constituents, uh, as he does uh, from uh, his. Uh, but it is important, and I think he recognised that in his question, that we do try to deal in reality. And I think it's important to put on record that this report does not show that there is an increased uh, risk of being stopped and searched if you're black or Asian uh, than if you are not. Uh, but where Anna Sarwar, I think, is right, and, and I know this from my constituents, is there is uh, or there can be a perception of that. And often, as we know, tackling the perception of something is uh, as important as tackling the reality. So this is an issue we will continue to take seriously in the further evaluation that I I spoke about uh, I think will be helpful to us as we do that. In, in terms of uh, the remainder of Anna Sarwar's question, 
Uh, as he knows, all searches conducted by Police Scotland under the Code of Practice, including those that take place at airports, railways and on roads, are captured uh, by Police Scotland and published on a quarterly basis. Uh, information related to searches carried out under reserved powers is collated and reported by the UK Government and searches carried out by British Transport Police are recorded on their own database and reported separately. Um, I certainly understand the concern that some uh, in the Asian community have, particularly about their experiences at airports and therefore uh, the Justice Secretary is looking into this matter uh, further and will write to uh, Mr Sarwar. So it's important uh, firstly uh, that we uh, recognise any perception that our ethnic minority communities have and seek to tackle that perception uh, but it's also important that we recognise uh, the good work also done in good faith by police officers the length and breadth of the country. Question number seven, Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the capacity of the Scottish Police Authority and whether the organisation is fit for purpose. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Police Authority has implemented a number of changes in relation to governance and accountability since its new chair, Susan Deacon, started her appointment in December last year. This includes steps to ensure greater simplification, transparency and clarity around SPA's governance and to ensure decisions are underpinned by effective processes and enhanced professional advice. The current public appointments round for which interviews are taking place this week will bring up to five new board members, uh, enhancing the SPA's capacity to scrutinise policing and hold Police Scotland to account. Uh, and of course, Audit Scotland for the first time gave an unqualified and unmodified opinion on the SPA accounts for 2016-17. Lee MacArthur. Thank you. The recommendations set out in this report will go a long way to resolving the issues and concerns raised. That was the last SPA Chair, Andrew Flanagan, speaking nearly two years ago after the Justice Secretary had asked him to conduct a review. What followed was a succession of failures leading to Mr Flanagan's resignation and the SPA's reputation being dragged through the mud again. The latest report was co-authored by the SPA Deputy Chair. Does the First Minister not recognise that rather than members of the SPA marking their own homework, it's time we had an independent, expert-led commission that can examine the whole picture, including the roles of police bosses, parliament, councils and the Justice Secretary? First Minister. Well, uh, in terms of the Justice Secretary, of course, it's for this parliament to hold the, the Justice Secretary uh, to account. But in the broader... Uh, issue. I do think it's important to recognise the changes that Susan Deacon has herself made since she uh, came into office as the new chair of the SPA. So, for example, she has implemented single board meetings to discuss public and private issues while setting out how items of private business are addressed. She's initiated an examination of board business, committee structures and the governance framework of the board. She's strengthened engagement and dialogue with Parliament including with uh, committee conveners. Uh, the Complaints and Conduct Committee has been reinstated with delegated decision-making power. She's moved to improve the performance management of board members with a continuous and accelerated one-to-one -one programme of improvement. Um, and I'm sure she will also consider the comments uh, from the Parliament's Audit Committee as part of uh, that process. Uh, in terms of the review uh, that we're talking about now, as uh, Susan Deacon herself said, it will help to inform the wider programme of improvement work now being uh, taken forward. Uh, and it focuses specifically on executive support to the board and sits alongside the work that I've already mentioned that Susan Deacon has been undertaking. So uh, I would hope uh, that the member would recognise the work that has been done and the determination on the new chair's part to make sure that progress of this nature continues. Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, the review found that local communities, local police scrutiny conveners and local politicians are effectively shut out from inputting into policing decisions. So does the First Minister accept the review's conclusion that the SNP's structures have fundamentally undermined localism in policing? First Minister. Uh, speaking as a, a local constituency MSP, I would have to say uh, no. I mean, I regularly speak to local police about issues and priorities in my own constituency, and I uh, would assume that most members across uh, the country do that. Uh, but it is important, and we have always said that it is important that there is local accountability in policing and as the member rightly says that was one of the issues talked about in the review so uh, the recommendations that have been made uh, in the review will complement the work that Susan Deacon uh, has already undertaken and I would expect her uh, in consultation with her, her colleagues to take forward uh, these recommendations as she considers appropriate. And Stuart Stevenson. 
uh, with the impending appointment of five new board members, uh, what uh, input has the new chair of the SPA, Susan Deakin, had in setting the agenda for that, in ensuring that the job descriptions are proper and getting a fully effective board? First Minister. Susan Deakin has uh, had considerable input into that and as I said interviews for new board members uh, are taking uh, place this week. I've already uh, outlined in my earlier uh, answers some of the steps that are being taken to better support uh, board members and to ensure good performance management uh, of them. So I think all of that should be welcomed. I've also already outlined a range of other measures that Susan Deakin uh, has taken. I think there is uh, an openness uh, around the fact that improvements required to be made in how the S SPA was doing its business. Uh, improvements have been made and I'm sure they will continue to be made uh, as the new chair considers uh, appropriate. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Graeme Simpson on Save the Green Belt. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change their seats.